Hello, everyone, again. Please note this meeting is being recorded. And for those needing translation into Spanish or another language, the instructions for automatic translation are given in the chat. This is Judy Lang. On behalf of myself and Dana Wisenich Mendez, welcome to the September Partners Meeting of the Caribbean Cooperation Team, or CCT. Our Zoom meeting today is being hosted by AGRA with Program Director Patricia Kramer at the controls. The CCT is now helping our partners prepare to res rescue corals that are susceptible to SCTLD. But the entire Northern Hemisphere has been unusually hot this year. Reef corals in Florida and the Western Caribbean were turning pale already in early June and major bleaching events soon followed in these areas. It's still hot. You may know that NOAA's Coral Reef Watch modeling has predicted that by the end of September, virtually the entire Caribbean could reach bleaching alert level two, meaning we can expect at least some mortality of reef corals across virtually our entire region. Hence today, we are presenting a webinar about this current emergency and have opened the meeting up to other Agra associates. I am incredibly grateful to our wonderful colleagues who will be talking today for all having agreed at relatively short notice to prepare these presentations to share with you. We will begin with descriptions of the impacts of the bleaching and sometimes also of disease so far this year at some Caribbean locations. We'll hear first from Julio Camacho, a marine ecologist at the National Parks Authority for Antigua and Bermuda, who will have to leave after talking. So we thank him very much in advance for his contribution. Can we have the uh, agenda slide up, Trisha, please? Yep, sure thing. Okay, thank you. Um, He'll be followed by Lorenzo Alvarez, a researcher at the UNAM Reef Systems Academic Unit in Puerto Morelos for the Mexican Caribbean. Then Valeria Pizarro, senior scientist at the Perry Institute for Marine Science for the Bahamas, and Alize Zimmerman, the executive director of the Turks and Caicos Reef Fund on behalf of the United Kingdom's overseas territories. After Alize's talks, we'll have time for a discussion with all these speakers. Please write your questions in the chat so you don't forget them. And be sure to address the intended recipient or geographic area of interest. So, Rulio, please begin. Good day, everyone. Um, again, thank you for having me here today. Um, primarily what I want to talk to you guys about as the slides are being pulled up is um, coral bleaching and um, rapid tissue loss that we've been seeing in Antigua and Barbuda. I'm just going to wait a second for the slides to be pulled up here. What? Be right with you. <laughs> nope, no problem. Okay, there you go. Okay, yes, thank you. All right, um, so next slide. Essentially, what we've we have started to notice um, changes in sea temperature. Uh, we use a hobo temperature logger that's that's um, located at around twenty five deep, twenty five feet deep. And from about late April, we noticed like a, a two degree Celsius rise in temperature within a two week period, um, which has maintained essentially since then coming up um, throughout the, the rest of the month. Uh, the temperatures have maintained, and we're recording similar temperatures throughout the water column. So th this log is located at 25 feet at a, at a well-flushed um, area that maxes out at about 35 feet depth. But even diving in areas 60, 70 feet, we're recording um, similar temperatures on our dive computers, which has been quite concerning. Next slide. So as a result of that, um, what we've noticed quite a bit is 
especially early in the year, we started to see a large increase in rapid tissue loss. Um, cases were noted in May, but in particular in August among the acroporids, um, primarily palmatas and cervicalis within the nursery. Um, we are seeing quite a bit of rapid tissue loss occurring. Uh, we have tried culling corals, um, cutting off areas that are that are being affected. Um, that sometimes help to some extent, but not completely. And again, this this increase in the incidence that we've been seeing was closely correlated when we saw the increase in sea temperature. Next slide. Um, what we're also now seeing is quite a bit of paling and spot bleaching among um, different coral colonies. Um, it's a, a bit sporadic. Um, it, we do have some more assessments to carry out, and I'm really hoping that the passage of Hurricane Lee to the North actually helped to stir up and reduce sea temperatures a bit, but I haven't been able to check it as yet. But we are noticing definitely paling, and then like you can see on this diesel to the top right, we are also seeing um, spot bleaching starting to occur. Uh, it's something that we are concerned about primarily because there's no easy way to control sea temperature. And it's something that we'll continue to monitor. And I'm, I really regret that I won't be here for the rest of this talk today, but I will get an update from Judy, I'm sure then. But it is um, something that we're very concerned about. That's, that's me. Thank you so much, Julio. Thank you, Judy. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate you taking time out of your overly busy schedule today. Um, we will next hear from uh, Lorenzo Alvarez Philip, who uh, will talk about um, the Mexican Caribbean and a little bit about the Pacific side, too. And I see he's already pulled up his uh, talk. So, Lorenzo, thank you. Thank you, Judy and, and Patricia. Uh, so my presentation is on, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the for the, the invitation. I'm just, uh, as Judy mentioned, this is about about uh, it's, it's, it's getting warm all across the Caribbean and also the Pacific coast. I will just give a really brief introduction about Mexico, not just the Caribbean. Uh, and the first. Uh, bleaching that was observed was in Huatulco, in the Pacific coast of Mexico. Uh, I, I don't know if you are familiar with the Posilopora patches, which is like plagues, huge plagues, and they became bleached in maybe late May, early June, like in the, in the left uh, photo. And by the start of, of August, most of these patches were already dead. Uh, so this is, is is affecting really heavily some, some of the reefs in the Pacific coast. Uh, another region is the in the Gulf of Mexico, Veracruz. Veracruz was not really affected or the bleaching was not really observed until maybe the last 10 days or even the last week. And these are some photos taken uh, two days ago in, in, in Veracruz. It's just uh, Acropora cervicornis and Acropora palmata uh, stands completely bleached in very shallow reefs. In deep reefs in Veracruz, uh, bleaching is start to, to observe in some colonies, but not as widespread as, as in shallow reefs. And obviously in Puerto Morelos, where I work and, and most of the data that we have is, is, is from. Uh, just this graph showing the temperature. This, this temperature is from the reef lagoon underwater sensors, high resolution sensors, uh, measuring temperature every minute. And I'm just showing the in red, the line, the trend for 2023, and in gray, the trend for the, the average trend of the previous five years, 2018 to 2022, years that already were uh, warmer than before. But you can see just the, 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 the difference between the red and the gray line is in, it started at the end of June, then some peaks in July, and then a massive, massive peak that reached three and even three and a half uh, degrees higher than the average of the last five years. 
Then we have the tropical storm. Here was a tropical storm, Italia, that formed and just dropped the temperature quite a lot until maybe reaching 29. It was a, a breeze for the corals, but unfortunately now we're seeing that the temperature is going up again. And in uh, the last week, the uh, temperature was already one uh, uh, cent uh, degree above normal again. Uh, in early August, we also run a rapid monitoring of several sites here in Puerto Morelos. Everything that is blue means that visually is healthy. Everything that is not blue is either dead or bleach or pale. Uh, you will see that some sites are, are uh, uh, widespread bleach. And in early August, we already start to see some mortality on, on some of these reefs. Uh, I'm going to give you an update. We don't have, we, we have the data, but we haven't entered and processed the data. So I'm, I'm only showing some photos. This is one of the most famous reefs here in Mexico. It's uh, the Acropora palmata is, is a huge, huge patches of Acropora palmata. Limones Reef, you will see, you, you can see a, fo a photo in the, in the left side, how it looked before, now how it looks bleach. Uh, but it's very interesting that in this side, in Limones, we have some stands of Acropora that are fully bleach and just a few meters from them, you will find some patches that are still okay, and they they are in a very shallow water as well. Uh, other other sites that were more affected in August were already bleached, not just corals, soft corals, anemones. Everything was bleached. It was like Christmas. Uh, some acroporas were already dead uh, by by August, and now in September, this is the this is the uh, picture. Uh, some massive corals are still doing relatively okay. Well, they are bleached, but they are not dead. Uh, but we now have the reefs covered with this uh, cyanobacteria all over the reef. Most of the uh, acroporas, most of the uh, soft corals have already died. And you see, this is a photo from a reef very close to the, to the La Bocana. And all of these are acroporas that are already dead. Recently, they, they died like a month ago. Uh, we have restoration sites here as well. They look affected, but they're still alive in August 2023. By September 2003, all, most of the restoration sites were already dead, with the exception of one site or one nursery area that, that was moved from shallow to deeper reefs. Uh, to from five to 10 meters. These corals are relatively okay. Some have died, some are bleached, but some others are okay. Uh, and well, the question, why some reefs are still are severely affected, completely bleached and with widespread mortality and others are doing relatively, relatively okay, or at least uh, we don't see this widespread mortality. And the answer is just very, very uh, superficial now, is temperature. We have some reefs in which the temperature has uh, passed the, 20, the 33 degrees, and most of these reefs are really affected. On those reef sites that the temperature reach 32, but remain around it, and or even a little bit low, the bleaching is not that bad. The, the accumulation of the stress is the same, but it's not the, uh, the intensity of the temperature that reach that, that level. And I, I, I just want to finish saying that we know uh, relatively little of what, what is happening here in Mexico. Most of our information comes from Puerto Morelos, not just from the UNAM, also from the Marine Park and some citizen brigades that are collecting data. But we really need to produce more data and understand what is happening at regional levels, not, on, not just in the Caribbean, but also in the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Uh, we will next hear from Valeria Pizarro, uh, who will address the situation in the Bahamas for us. Hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Patricia, Judy, Paul, for the invitation. So I'm just going to give you a very brief um, summary of what we have been observing. And I have to thank the Department of um, um, Environment Protection 
and planning and protection in the Bahamas because they're giving us the permission to share this information, but we don't have any project related or specific to coral bleaching. Next. So as you, as most of you might know, right now we are dealing with the stony coral tissue loss disease. We have been like kind of just looking how this disease is spreading around the Bahamas and it's in most of the family islands. So the Bahamas is uh, an island country and we have many, many islands and the disease is in most of them. We are starting to see bleaching in some of the reefs and I will just explain to you in, in a little bit. But I have to say that our observations are just like kind of in the places where we have been just conducting research uh, related to stony coral tissue loss disease and some reef assessments. But we are sure that this is affecting most of the of the Bahamas. As Gator is putting in the comments, Guam Bahama is for sure another place that is occurring. Next. So we first observed um, just some bleaching and paling in actually mid-July this year, the water temperatures were between like surface, like 33. And then when you were going down to eight, 10 meters, we were having like 32 degrees. And from all the species, especially in shallow places, we're starting to see like bleaching and you have the species listed there. It wasn't as bad, like kind of 10% of all the species, but of course like, Acropoids were heavily affected, all the fire corals, some agaricias, and, and some poridus asteroides as well. Next. And then at the end of July, beginning of August, actually, we went to different places, uh, including, well, New Providence, where Nassau is located, another island that is very close to here, Rose Island, Eleuthera, and... and sorry, and exumas, and we start to seeing that bleaching was becoming really a big problem. So we didn't have like 10% as at the beginning of July, but now it was 50 to 60%. Most of the species were uh, were bleaching or pale, and we started to see some coral mortality. Sadly, like in all the shallow places, the wild colonies of Acropora cervicornis and Acropora palmata started to die, uh, at least in the places that we visited. And we, of course, decided to see some Milepora complanata dying, as um, Lorenzo just showed in the, in the photos, and as well some Poritas asteroides and Agaricia agaricides. And this was, again, end of July, the last week of July, first week of August this year. Next. In mid-August, we went to Exumas and we did some monitoring again related to stony coral tissue loss disease in Agra. And we saw that actually this, this bleaching was affecting most of the corals. So right now we have between 80 to 90% of all coral species bleach. Um, it's in almost every depth. Like we went to places as shallow as three meters to as deep as 18 meters as this photo that you can see there is actually in Exumas. And this is a 16 meter reef. As you can see, like you can see where the corals are perfectly. Like there's, they're just like kind of very bright and you can see where they are. But sadly, like they're very bleached. We don't know, like we're gonna go into the, the field again, not related again, more to stony coral tissue loss disease. And to see what is happening, but of course we will record if we have any mortality. And in the in the mid August, uh, colleagues that they have another project that they had a they have a glider um, working with NOAA and the Cape Luther Institute. They recorded at um, 100 meters, 30 degrees Celsius. So water temperature is warm, has been warm for a really long time. The only thing that we were a little um, happy, but at the same time, we don't know. And if anyone has any ideas or thoughts or have seen the same in, in next two months, in some, in some areas, stony coral tissue loss disease hasn't been observed, it's not present. And the highly 
susceptible species like Montastria cavernosa, Milia fasciara, Dicosenia stochesi, um, most of the madrasis, some madrasis are written rubber bleach, but most of them they weren't, and mandrina mandrides, they were like kind of just a few colonies were bleached, but most of the colonies, at least two weeks ago, they weren't bleached or didn't have any sign of paling. Next. So we, we of course were very worried what can happen, but the good news is that some people did some observation of corresponding uh, last week, and we had at least for the star corals some massive bleaching. So who knows if these babies will survive this this heat wave? But it's a good thing to see corals reproducing. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. And the next person in this session will be Alize Zimmerman, who will account for the uh, overseas territories of the United Kingdom, of which she has five of the six on the screen now. Hi, good, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, so my name is Alize Zimmerman. I'm the executive director of the Turks and Caicos Reef Fund, and I sit on a few regional meetings, one specifically for the UK overseas territories. Um, so I got some updates from our other islands um, across the region. Uh, some good news from Anguilla so far, um, and this is as of Tuesday, the 5th of September. So last week, Tuesday, so far, a little bit of peeling, but no widespread bleaching. bleaching. Bermuda continues to be um, this little hope spot as far as uh, they still have not received any or seen any observations of SCTLD there. Um, and uh, we were told that there is still no signs of bleaching there this summer, um, although hopefully they'll be all right with this hurricane that's heading that way. Um, Montserrat, I spoke with them actually uh, on Tuesday, but also yesterday, and they're heading out this week to do monitoring. So um, but um, as of last week, they didn't have any observations um, to see. I'm seeing in the chats people talking from Martinique and Guadeloupe, and I was actually in St. Lucia a week ago, and there was some paling starting, especially in the Sidorastrias um, as well. The British Virgin Islands, on the other hand, um, had in early August, um, courtesy of Argel Horton, who sent me the photos and information, massive Elkhorn bleaching that was seen in um, you know, it's a small photo, but you can see the bright white spots that stick out on that photo below. Um, however, they did go in the water um, on September 8th um, and uh, positively she said, you know, most of the corals are still alive, uh, a fair amount of paling, but still alive and no signs of stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, in the Cayman Islands, um, we had a report that was submitted to AGRA from Anne Vider, um, who uh, reported that in August, uh, there was some bleaching specifically on agaricias or bacillids, um, parades and sidorastrias. And I spoke with our uh, partners from the Department of Environment there and the reports are pending. I did have a conversation uh, with a friend at CCMI in Little Cayman and anecdotally for the moment, she said this might be the worst they've ever seen. Um, but they are going to be sharing that data in the coming weeks. Next slide, please. And so where I can speak a little more of is in the Turks and Caicos. Um, and uh, like many people, I haven't actually been in the water much over the past month, um, having taken some time off. But uh, reports from around the country in South Caicos in early August, they had some paling that had just started, but depths of 60 feet plus. And most of that is our big plate corals. Uh, we have quite a dramatic wall here in the Turks and Caicos and um, those plating corals have uh, been paling. And I can observe, I can say that on this side around Providencialis as well, um, this photo here in the bottom middle, the blue photo, I took that photo five days ago from about 70 feet looking down. So that's probably around 90 feet. Um, and there was a lot of bleaching happening there. Um, and same for Grand Turk. Um, so 
we, you can see the information here about the species that we had bleaching around Providencialis. And I actually went through my photos and found that as early as July 14th, I was photographing uh, the first three photos on the bottom there were taken in less than 10 feet of water on the on the 14th of July. Um, and so we were already starting to see temperature um, problems there and I didn't have a, a logger with me. But on September 8th, I did uh, get 89 uh, Fahrenheit. So I think around 30 um, Celsius on my dive computer on this dive. And that's also where I photographed that barrel sponge on the bottom right um, that can be seen uh, kind of dying from the bottom up, whether that is heat related or not, I'm not sure. But I do have a little bit of positive news from Turks and Caicos. Well, there's more to come, but East Caicos, uh, we were there for a week on a research trip, July 29th to August 5th. And the reefs there were no signs of paling, very vibrant colors, huge amount of recruitment and some really beautiful uh, massive corals still there. On our way back to Providencialis, we did do a dive in an area called Sambor Channel, and that was on the 4th of August, and the reef there was already showing quite significant signs of bleaching. Um, next, please. But I just felt the need to uh, throw a little, a little hope in there. Um, uh, everybody on this call is dealing with uh, with quite a huge crisis and it's it's not a fun thing and it can be quite painful. But every photo on this slide I took within the last week, actually, I know I wrote 10 days there, but actually all my diving happened last week, Wednesday and Thursday. So um, that's when these photos were taken. So um, some really positive in that sense that uh, the recruitment at the top, especially, um, is always good to see. But one thing I noticed was that our monstreas, our great star corals, uh, really weren't, I didn't see any signs of paling or bleaching. And on that second photo at the bottom, you can even see the plating agaricia that's fully bleached with almost a meter tall um, MCAB next to it. I was very pleasantly surprised. I was not expecting the positive news, but our um, Acropora nursery at Eel Garden a couple of them showed a little bit of paling, but otherwise they were looking quite healthy. This photo was taken last week on September 8th. Um, and then the one area that I'm most uh, passionate about right now is our rescue corals of uh, our rescue tables with the massive corals for that were gene banking uh, due to SCTLD. And they have been rescued and kind of waiting in situ for a while. Most of them were okay. I I am surprised to say that this middle photo here is in any way positive, um, but it is. We have only lost a handful of corals, and at the moment they seem to be hanging on. Um, our temperature monitor is reading around 30.5 to 30.8 degrees based on whether it's at a meter or three meters of depth. And um, but I just think it's really important to hold on to these little babies and the hope that they can bring us. So with the next slide, I will just say thank you um, for letting me uh, report and um, yeah, keep keep your heads up. Thank you very much, Elise. And we will now open the floor for questions and a little discussion. So would anybody care to um, speak up? or um, ask a question that might be hidden in the chat among all the wonderful information we're getting from people with um, their oh, observations please. of water temperature and, and bleaching elsewhere. Impossible, ils veulent pas te comme les toi. Yes, Claude. Yes, uh, severe bleaching started in Guadeloupe uh, last week on the... Uh, on the site, uh, we have a monitor. Uh, there was about 30 species of corals, and 30 was loudly uh, bleached. Uh, the only coral which has no sign of bleaching is as usual, Oritis, as and uh, the Mucidae are not very touched, touch. and uh, are not touched, but the most of the core of the reef, which have been in. Uh, uh, destroyed by the SCTLD as are bleaching now. I don't know what will uh, result at the end of uh, the next year. Uh, that will remain, of course. 
Thank you, Claude, very much. Um, there is so much information coming up on the chat. First of all, I hope uh, Patricia will be begging everybody to put some of this on the Agra tracking map uh, before we're finished. But uh, so could we focus our quest our questions on content that came from any of the talks we've heard? And if um, we have a question from Dana, Emma, and perfect um, Gabby. <laughs> So stop, stop me, this is Dana, if this is still to come or you were hoping to solicit some information in the following conversation on this, but I, we heard a lot about observations, but I was curious as to what actions folks are thinking about taking or able to start planning to take potential interventions. Am I jumping the gun? Yes. yes. Well, Yes. Sorry. <laughs> well, well, okay. that's, that's part two, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay. We're glad, you're, we're glad you're interested. <laughs> and anxiously and eagerly anticipating that information. <laughs> okay. Thank Genevieve, you. Genevieve, can you unmute? Yes. Hello. Um, good day, everyone. I am in Antigua. Here, I'll start my video. I'm actually currently in Canada visiting some family, but... Um, in Antigua, we've been seeing a lot of repetitulas and aphorids, and I know um, Rulio spoke about that within his presentation, and I was wondering if any other countries have seen repetitulas and aphorids and what they're doing about it to prevent it in either nurseries or just in, in wild race or even on restoration sites. Um, Alizé, if you want to go ahead and you can answer. <laughs> Well, I was uh, sure. going to say, yeah. I was going to say, people can also answer that for Genevieve in the chat. Um, but Alizé, do you want to share your your comments or your response to that? Uh, sure, quickly. It was just that uh, we did our first outplant in uh, May, um, and we did see that there was a a presence of white band disease within maybe a month. So they they came from being uh, hung and um, hanging out in kind of the moving water to to being secured to the ocean floor. And so if, I found that the closer they are to the ground, the more they seem to be ha uh, prone to getting white bend. But I don't know if that's because of the area had little water movement. Um, yeah. And just to repeat the question, um, Lisa for Lisa Karn, um, uh, Genevieve was asking that she's been seeing a lot of rapid tissue loss in aquaporids. Has anybody else seen that? Um, and Lorenzo, I'm not sure if you have seen any of that in your uh, acroporids um, where you are or not. Uh, yes, well, just a little bit, but I'm, I was just assuming that is part of the bleaching because the, the tissue was, you know, uh, like fluffing in in acroporas that were really really uh, impacted by bleaching and and they were already dying so if you have the branch sometimes the the top part of the branch is completely white or even dead and in the bottom part you can see this this like rapid tissue thing happening but i was just assuming that is is part of the bleaching how how quickly is 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 killing the corals in if they are three or four uh, uh, degrees above normal. I was just assuming that, but maybe it's, an, it's a disease. That's exactly why we're asking because we've seen some of it in the winter season, but as the warmer temperatures started to come in, we didn't actually see any bleaching. We're just seeing a lot more of this rapid tissue loss or rapid tissue necrosis. And we have no idea if it's, um, uh, you know, a disease or if it's ciliates or if it's, yeah, a response to temperature. So I was just hoping to get a little bit more clarity on that. Maybe Andrew Ross could explain what he's seen. And I will ask the general question, is anybody in a position to collect tissue samples for histopathology or molecular analyses while you're seeing this um, rapid tissue loss or whatever, if you're, you, whatever you call it? And I put that out there. And if nobody is, send me an email after the meeting and I will try to help you get organized to do that. 
but be advised it takes a while to get the preservatives by ship to wherever you are in the Caribbean. You would love to be a part of that, Judy, so I'll, I'll send you an email after this. Andrew. Please, Judy. Andrew, then Lisa. Can you send us a protocol? No more jammies. Uh, kill the music, kill the music, kill the music. All right. Uh, hi, Judy. Hi, Andrew. All right, first things first, because this is far more fun. Uh, we found yesterday, right in front of Half Moon Beach, just the side of Negril, a one meter tall dendrogyra with no sign of disease whatsoever. Everything around it was dead. We had one little pillar, it was perfect. All right, look at me, hair is standing up. I don't get it as much <laughs> as you can tell. One uh, apologies, for, <laughs> apologies for my pajamas in the office. This is a work day. Um, okay, uh, we saw, we had just, death of sort of half of a couple of very large colonies right around Christmas time. And it's something that we often see in medium sized corals and in small ones, particularly uh, long term outplants after two or three years related to rain events. Judy, you and I have talked about this before. It does seem to be rapid. It does seem to be a discrete lesion and a, a discrete front that moves. Um, what we saw this year was discrete front in the wild in June, July probably related to high temperatures. And then that seemed to putter its way over into the nursery, albeit I don't know why there was a delay and there may have not been a delay. Um, Cause the, just the discrete corals and we just, it was a bad nursery set anyway this year, we had a lot of mortality. Um, but what we really did see is in the last stage before planting, we sort of take, we make them into hundred piece bundles where they're all in contact. Is, you know, it, it's only supposed to happen for about 24 hours and it was. Anywhere where there was existing disease or disease had come into that bundle. Now, this bundle may have seven or eight different genetic lineages in it. Started and moved as a mushy sort of a front mm -hmm. along that thing, Before along that line of discrete utes, discrete isolates that are in contact just by gravity. Uh, they're suspended in contact just for a very short term little holding period that accelerates the next day's planting. Um, in terms of collecting material, send us a list of what we would need. Uh, but our event seems to be finished, unfortunately. Uh, at least the disease element of the event, we're not really seeing it anymore. It's largely gone, and we've emptied out that nursery um, it, to refill it starting in about two weeks. And then we'll keep an eye on it from that. Uh, the, but the, that sort of mushiness that comes along, it's, it, we used to call it golden snot, because it it'll dribble off, and any coral that's underneath, like in a, ver in a vertical system, if it drops onto it, bang, he's got it as well. Um, but that it looks, it seems to look differently in the nursery that it has on, uh, on the parent, assuming it's the same thing. The expectation being, if you've got some sort of wave mo motion, as soon as the tissue is available to be moved, it'll get brushed off by the waves. Whereas in the nursery, because the whole thing's moving, the snot is retained and then you get to see it. Horrible as that happens to be. Does that answer the question? Thank you. The question can be answered at the moment. And anyone else with comments on disease um, acroporus, please put it in the chat. Um, and before um, Judy, we move on to the, are you trying to? Judy, real quickly, I was going to let Lisa talk real quickly so she can answer, also provide input. Um, and then we have one more question. I think we have enough time for one or two more quick little questions or comments. Um, Lisa, have... go ahead. Super. Thank you. Good morning. I see Esther is here. And so, you want to live long, Esther, because I was just going to mention your name. That um, And you can correct me if I say this wrong. I should just let you go. But since 2011, and in fact, what Andrew described is not what I call RTL at all. It's completely different. It's more like a sloughing of the tissue that it looks like to me. And Esther, hopefully you can correct me if I'm wrong. But the last I heard from you when we did send in samples and stuff was that there was no way to really distinguish between white band versus RTL. And I am glad that you're here because you said there was a certain phrase that we should just use for sort of rapid. Um, uh, I'll let you go from here, Esther. So um, in other words, since 2011, we've, we've been um, seeing this uh, come and go on both wild and um, nursery acroporids. With that, I think Esther should pipe in. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Lisa and Judy. Um, what I wanted to say for Andrew was the mushiness that he's talking about could be due to ciliate infections. 
um, which can uh, destroy the tissue at that uh, margin as well as uh, up into the into the coral branch and so it, another case for where we really need to look at things microscopically to be sure that we know what's going on and yes uh, the corals uh, the acroporids in the caribbean have a chronic infection with a rickettsia uh, member uh, that, that's a primitive bacterium uh, Acra rickettsia roeri, and I believe that, well, it is infecting the, the mucocytes of these corals, and that the stress um, of the corals having to regenerate their mucocytes continuously in order to help protect themselves from other things uh, is what makes them more susceptible when another stressor comes along. I have a slide that illustrates this, but I know Judy and everybody want to move on with the program. Um, maybe I can show that at a, at a later time. Thank you, Esther, for all those. Uh, and Esther, at the end, if you would like, we can maybe share that um, slide that yeah. you were talking about. Um, just real quickly, I don't know if Kendon has um, lowered his hand, um, but if you still have a question, I had one quick question for Lorenzo. Um, while we get to Kendon, Lorenzo, you had shown a slide where you showed uh, the amount of mortality that is occurring on the acropora. And I was wondering if you could give perspective on that amount of mortality that you're seeing now, how that compares to past bleaching events that you've seen, um, to kind of get a perspective of the level of impact that this particular uh, heat stress event is having compared to past ones. Thank you, Patricia. We haven't seen anything like this before, period. It's it's just crazy. Uh, we have had bleaching event in, events in the past, 2019, 2015, 2010, 2005. And we start seeing bleaching for, uh, uh, maybe in September, mid-September, and it will result in some mortality by October, but very, very little mortality. We started the bleaching event in May, uh, early June, and mortality started in maybe the last week of July. In some reefs, mortality for some species like Acropora is just widespread. All the Acroporas that are in the reef behind me are just gone. Oh, okay. So that's definitely quite a bit. Giving us an idea that this is a very serious event, and for other people in the Caribbean to keep a really close eye on the. Yes, just if you are familiar with the degree heating weeks, the the thermal stress measured from NOAA, uh, the previous degree heating weeks in our region, the highest was maybe eight or nine degree heating weeks. Now we are approaching twenty, and this haven't finished. Great, thank you for that. Um, Kendon, did you want to ask a quick question? Hi, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Kendon from Grenada. I just wanted to find out for the Acropora, especially Acropora palmata, um, are the, you guys seeing any signs of um, recovery? Um, if yes, uh, please indicate like a time period as to how much weeks or if no signs at all, uh, just to get some information. In Mexico, we haven't seen any recovery. So we have this period of, of you know, the temperature drop and the corals, the acroporas just stay relatively white, but didn't recover. And now temperature goes up again. So they, they will not have, they didn't have enough uh, space to, to recover. We have seen recover, for example, in orbicellas. In this two weeks period, some of the orbicellas just get brown patches again, but unfortunately, temperature is going up. So Okay, folks, Lisa will address that question when she gives her talk in a few minutes, but we need to give the other people a chance to speak as well. So I'm going to ask Simon to switch into his presentation mode and uh, give us the first of the temporary responses that are being undertaken to mitigate the warming 
on corals in areas that are currently uh, existing in nurseries or already outplanted on Caribbean reefs and affected by the uh, bleaching event or potentially will be affected by the bleaching event to come. So here's Simon Walsh, the owner of Nature Island Dive in Dominica for moving corals into deeper water in Florida and Dominica. Hello, Simon. Are you on mute? I mean, we can see your video, but we cannot hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for having me on. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start by saying I am not officially with Reef Renewal or um, presenting anything that is directly from them. Uh, I'll give you a very quick situation of, of why I was there. I was supposed to be in the States for another project, which was canceled. And I called uh, Ken Niedermeyer and asked if I could visit him to work with um, uh, the stony corals affected by stony coral tissue loss disease not a, a crop roots. So he invited me to come and uh, visit his nurseries and see his MCAVs and B-cells and, and corals. Uh, and before I got there, we had the massive um, bleaching situation happening in Florida. So when I called him, he said, basically, uh, I'm in an emergency response from, from reef renewal. So um, I spent a few days with him in this absolutely amazing response uh, and basically, in a nutshell, what they were doing was moving corals from their shallow reefs, which were in about 10 meters. Um, and these are all mostly palmata out to the brand new reef that they are, brand new nursery that they were installing in this emergency out in about um, 18 meters. Uh, the temperature we recorded on the shallow nursery was about, and I'm sorry for it being in Fahrenheit, but we were in the States. So it was um, about 31 on the surface and 30 degrees on the at the bottom. And on the deeper nursery that we installed, it was about 86, 87 degrees. So the distance between the two nurseries, the new one and the, the additional one was about two kilometers. So we were moving everything. An absolutely amazing thing to be part of. The aquarium came down. It's actually in, in uh, Ken's driveway and boats were just pulling up and getting loaded and people were being trained uh, how to install duck bills for the new nursery. Um, and then you can see here the piles of moorings that were uh, being installed. Uh, and then here was a non-diver. I think this might have been their son-in-law. He basically just floated on the surface and reattached moorings as um, ropes were coming up from the new duck bills. So there was just this amazing response from everything was happening. Um, here you can see the nursery. Um, this, I believe, is the, the shallow nursery. So you can see different types of trees from just the rope systems to the PVC. Um, and this is Ken himself, uh, I think, doing a genotype check. Um, and here you see some of the um, stony corals affected by stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, I was privileged to move their last desil remnants out to the deeper reef. Um, so this is just showing uh, what we were moving out. And you can see they're all still in good shape, even though the lower keys had seen very dramatic bleaching at this point with heavy, heavy mortality, I believe, down the Lowe's Keys. Um, these corals were all still in good shape. And what uh, was happening here, you can see the volunteers um, working. Uh, and we had teams of people, well, actually, Ken uh, was being very specific in which genotypes he was moving and being very careful. Uh, so this jumps a little bit ahead. Um, and here you can see the genotype system they have with tags on everything, everything. And this is a, an unusual tree. Most of the trees were one specific genotype, uh, I believe. 
And so it was quite easy. Here we have the NOAA team who are installing new dive site moorings. Um, so the entire NOAA team were there drilling these, well, in, uh, screwing in these uh, boat moorings. So this was happening on the new nursery. Um, and here you can see everything happening. So you have people moving ropes. Um, you have people on the bottom putting corals into the ropes. And this is a technique that was, sorry, that we were basically doing. And it was, Ken was um, taking fragments of the, I should have put this into, okay, but he's taking fragments. He drops the bags to the bottom. The bottom team comes up, unzips the bags, takes the coral fragments out, um, and double checks the number of coral fragments. This is all one genotype. And the rope that you see there has the genotype tag on it. Um, this is actually Denise, his, uh, Ken's wife. And then opening up the rope to thread in the palmata. And then that rope would be transport, transported to either hang underneath the boat uh, or put onto a, a temporary tree. And then those will be moved to the boat. And then on the boat were large cans. Uh, here you can see a completed rope. And uh, this was all happening over the period of a few days. Uh, and after I left, and here you can see uh, Denise with a whole bunch of new fragments taking them to the boat uh, and then they will go into a large uh, can of water and can be transported out to the deep nursery where they'd be installed on the new duck bills that were being installed but it was a really 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 impressive thing to witness i did i'm pleased to say gets to spend some time with stony corals affected by stony tissue loss as well but mainly this is what we were doing was was literally transporting everything to the deeper reef. And of course, uh, anybody who's been watching, and this sort of shows the tree system that we were, and all of this was done nighttime. We would put these trees together, um, cut the ropes, put the shackles on. So morning, we'd start early, get all these things done. And then daytime, here you can see one of our, um, I think this was a genotype meeting. I was not part of this. Uh, we had another little section over to the right side and we were just putting ropes together and shackles and everything that had to be done. And uh, this is what the genotype team, so they plan the next day's approach. Uh, we were just showing some of the trees. Uh, this is the shallow nursery. Yeah, and I just like to thank Ken and Denise for hosting me and, uh, and trusting me to, to participate in this because they rarely just threw me in the water and said, if you're an instructor, a dive shop owner, or you know about coral, so off you go, get get to it and, and gave me directions and jobs that I had to do uh, and also allowed me to go off and, and play with the desils, which made me very happy. Um, so it was a truly, truly spectacular, uh, inspiring, as most of you know, Dominica, we have no human resource, very little financial resource. We're pretty remote and we really don't get to do anything like this because we just don't have the number of people. And so I think there were over 30 people involved in the days I was there, um, well over 30, five boats. Um, and, and it was really impressive to see the dedication and the passion of everybody just coming together. Reef renewal, move their, their reef to a safer location. Reports I've got is that the, the, certainly the deeper nursery are seeing very minor bleaching at this point. Um, I don't have reports on the shallow nursery. So I'd like to end up with a a little bit of report of what we're doing in Dominica. This will not be very long, but in Dominica, we're fairly lucky. We've only seen a little bit of paling in um, lettuce corals and fire coral. We're seeing definite bleaching in fire coral, but most of our other species are doing okay so far. Uh, I have had conversations, of course, with, with Judy and, and Dana and, and others about our response, what we could do if we were to see bleaching in our nursery. So uh, we're lucky in Dominica that our temperatures are still about 30 degrees um, from, from bottom to top. We do have a thermocline at about 30 to 32 meters. So we have been talking about lowering our trees. And if we want to go to deeper water in Dominica, all we have to do 
is pull, pull our trees down because most of our trees are in, the mooring block is in about 24 meters of water. So we can simply pull them deeper. Uh, we haven't seen a need to do this yet because we're not seeing bleaching except for the one lettuce coral that we have. We have nine species on this particular tree. This is the insulation day, so there are no species on it yet. Um, but it does show the depth that we're in. Uh, and I believe we have a little video here sort of showing the, the installation. This is a couple of years ago. Um, but you can see uh, it would be very easy for us to lower these trees. The trouble is we're seeing consistent water temperatures from 10 meters where the tree is to 20 meters where the bottom is. So we haven't really seen a need yet. Um, we have, this is another tree that we call the spiral staircase. Uh, and we have multiple designs of trees. This is a meandrina tree. This entire tree is nothing but meandrinas. Um, and we're not seeing any paling or bleaching yet. But we have been talking to Judy about potentially building a shading system. Uh, of course, in this tree, it's going to be a little bit challenging. This tree, we already have a design in mind for how we could shade it, but also because we have the double tray system here, the, the um, corals on the lower level are somewhat shaded uh, anyway. Um, so we have these plans of potentially pulling the trees deeper uh, and potentially shading them. So we're sort of on a, on a standby. Uh, we have about 12 species on our seven trees. And actually, funnily enough, we just installed our first acropora tree last week. So we're, we really don't have a cropper as a dominant species here. So most of the presentations so far have been very heavy on a croppers. The reason we, we're not talking about them a lot here is because it's just never been a dominant species. If you go 100 meters offshore, your average depth is going to be 30 to 60 meters already. So we have very easy access to deep water. So that's what we were doing in Florida as a volunteer. And uh, this is the response with being ready to take if we decide we, we need to, if we start to see any bleaching on our trees. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Simon. And please hold your questions until after the next talks. And following Simon will be Jessica Ward, uh, who is the Nature Conservancy's Virgin Islands Coral Program Director for their various efforts in St. Croix. And she will talk about other mitigation measures that are being tried in St. Croix. So please, Jessica. Right, here you come. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm cognizant of the time, so I'll try and get through this rather quickly. Um, I just wanted to give some context uh, to explain what we what it is that we do here. Uh, we restore at scale using um, several species across you know, tens of acres in marine protected areas. And so we're not doing anything small scalar or or um, experimental uh, per se. So we have a lot of material across a large area, um, and we support that work through both. Institute and execute nurseries. Our Coral Innovation Hub, which went online around March 2021, is our exit nursery is comprised of six upper raceways and 18 lower race, raceways with ozone sterilization, protein scaler, high capacity chiller, automated control systems, redundant generators. So we are very lucky that we have this uh, land based facility that we can use in this emergency situation. So beginning of the summer, we started to hear predictions of smash mass bleaching event unfolding in Florida and parts of the Caribbean. We had asked ourselves, okay, what do we have at risk here? Um, we have multiple in-water nurseries, nursery structures anyway, a couple dozen nursery structures that are filled with uh, coral material, uh, some that is over a year old and represents hours and hours of effort getting to that point. Um, we have orchards of proper palmata that are actually in a couple of brief locations that can't be moved. Um, and then we just outplanted over 13,000 corals of a few different species this past season. Uh, of course, 
there was not a whole lot that could be done about that. So we had to look at, okay, what, what do we have that is vulnerable that we can do something about? And so we came up with this three-pronged response, including moving all of our in-situ stock into our ex-situ facility. We just completed that last week. So all the material that can be moved um, to our in, our in facility has been moved. Um, you know, we had to do a bit of triage to look for things that were potentially diseased. Uh, the version I use now has a problem with ramacrusta, that uh, crustose algae that is overgrowing not only the substrates and materials, but the corals themselves. We didn't want to bring that into our system and have it infect our raceways. Um, and then uh, we had to look at a material that is actually not able to come into our system, um, in particular the acropras, which don't do, which don't fare great in the raceways. Um, and then of course our orchards, which are food to the reef and we have no way of moving those. So for that material, we opted to try shading. So anything that was gonna be left on some of our nursery tables, we added shades there, as well as to some of our actual orchard corals. Uh, what you're seeing here is sort of our first prototype and there were definitely lessons learned these are PVC frames that are mostly refurbished, repurposed from something that was already constructed um, just to try and save time and get something out there rapidly. We try to bolster their buoyancy with some cool little sections. Things we learned very quickly is that within a week, this, the shade cloth we put on top there, which I think is about 60% shade cloth, gets heavily fouled very, very quickly. This is, I think, five days after putting it out there. Uh, and what that does is it ends up weighing down that frame, which is just uh, attached with paracord uh, to the tables and to the reef. Uh, so it becomes very, uh, very fouled. And then additionally, the cool noodles that we were using started to compress, and so they were also starting to sink. So we removed some of the ones that are not um, as functional as we'd like and came up with the second prototype. We're waiting for the storm to pass and potential surge this weekend. Uh, and we plan to get out there uh, this week to install a new design that uses a much wider diameter PVC that's going to be sealed, included, and hopefully uh, has a lot more buoyancy than these early structures. Uh, and then our third prong was rescue of rare and vulnerable species. Uh, looking at not only just um, species that are vulnerable to stony coral tissue loss disease, but species that are just rare in this area. Um, DLAD, Fair Leopard Forest, have been pretty devastated by stony coral tissue loss disease in this area, Dicostenia, and of course, um, DCIL. And I just wanted to add, I didn't have a slide on it, a slide here for it specifically, but I wanted to mention that we are conducting um, bleach monitoring as well, where we are tagging individual coral colonies across multiple species. Uh, to look at not only how these species uh, fare through this bleaching event, but how they recover um, and where they resist it, and are these genes that we might particularly want to focus on um, sampling from a property into the future. Um, and we're also conducting some SFM plots to try and uh, get some data on the overall community impacts as well. Thank you, Jessica, that was perfect. Um, we are now going to switch to the permanent or long-term responses that um, can or are being taken. And we'll ask uh, Lisa Karn, who uh, is the founder and executive director of um, Fragments of Hope in Placencia Belize to uh, present her talk um, in which she will uh, be emphasizing the high importance of uh, fragments representing a large variety of genetic diversity. Thank you, Judy. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, super. So uh, I'm just gonna give a quick plug here that our 10th anniversary AGM is happening this week as well. If you haven't received an invite from me, the Zoom link is on our Facebook page and there's my email right there. I have a lot of information to share. We've been doing this a long time. I'm going to specifically talk about Laughing Bird Key National Park, which most people know about, where we know that we have over 30 different palmata genets and 20 cervaconus genets and five proliferogenets. 
And this little map of Laughing Bird, none of these maps are updated, I'm sorry. They're all a little old. Um, obviously, you need the genetic diversity for spawning, but also because there's obviously different behaviors with different individuals towards bleaching and disease events. Um, again, this is just giving you an idea of how much coral they out there, and there's actually a lot more we need to update our 2022 drone uh, imagery. So our strategy has been for over 10 years mapping the the living corals that uh, are surviving the hottest um, situations, right? And so on the right hand part of your screen, you're seeing two different genets, which you can hopefully tell have a different shape as well as a different bleaching pattern outplanted in 2010. Then the bottom photo is uh, prior to this year was our wor worst bleaching event in 2020. And then those recovered by December, 2020. Now this year, um, I can't see my screen because I see all the people on the right hand side of my screen. Um, that is dated hopefully for this year's bleaching event, which for Belize and Judy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think us in the Eastern Panama got it first and the worst in early June. In June. So we've had in our nearest shore hottest um, nursery site, uh, temperature went up to 33 degrees Celsius twice in June. And my current is gone off now. So let's see how far I can go. We had a storm here today. Just so that you know, um, this is just an example of Cervaconus, but, and it also needs to be updated. But when we first started, the question was, you know, ecotypes or subregions. So we would move in the different genets from uh, or nearby to our target restoration site. And so in our other sites, like up in Southwater Key Reserve, Marine Reserve, Turnaf, similarly, we're, you know, sourcing corals around that area. But again, as everybody knows now, aiming for a high level of, of genetic diversity. So now this is a short video just from this year showing um, dates like, and obviously they bleach because it's different genets. So it's not only just sub temperatures or exposure to UV. So this, I call this like the, the winners and the losers. So like this one has not died, but it's also not yet recovered. Um, this one in the middle is a different genet from the two next to it. And now um, it's sort of recovered versus the other two next to it. Uh, these staghorn patches are generally minimum of two to three different genets mixed up, often as many as five or six. Um, and then this is an example of a loser genet. Um, we've been doing genetics with um, Ileana Bombs for years. And so now the homework is on me to start putting together sort of histories, long-term histories, which we do have of individual uh, colonies and genets and match their bleaching history with the genetics and sort of like a little family album. So I think this is almost done. And um, again, really just illustrating that uh, you need that genetic diversity, not only for sexual reproduction, but also because obviously some are gonna be more susceptible to uh, disease and bleaching than others. And so these nice ones are obviously the winners. Some sites never even bleached at all during this extreme early uh, severe event in Belize. So these are what we're calling the winners, right? Here you see two different, clearly two different um, genets of staghorn here as well. I hope you can see the color variation and the thickness variation. This is a prolifera. Then you see at the same time, this prolifera not bleaching and a bunch of different genets around it. So that's what I was asked to discuss. Oops, let's not make it stop now, I'm almost done. And just to let you know, of course, this applies to other species. Um, this example is from the outer reef last year where clearly one just died from stony coral tissue loss and the current came back on. And the other one just touching it never even got it. And so obviously we'll be using the same strategy moving forward with other species um, after we sort of decide the stony coral tissue loss event is um, kind of, I don't know if it'll ever be over. Again, illustrating with the um, Stragosa, you can see one more pale than the other. One has black band, one doesn't. So this applies to like every coral species. Again, the Stragosa, you can see one more paling than the other. Um, and uh, of course the staghorn. And we do have um, other, uh, examples of different species. I just didn't have time to share it all. So thank you for your time and thank you for the invitation. And again, if I didn't answer your question, we have a two hour AGM this Thursday, two to 4 p.m. Belize time. <laughs> thank you very much, Lisa. Um, for our final presentation today, we will have Jessica will come back again. I see she's already smiling and present her thoughts on strategies going forward and 
Also the importance of placement in shallow water in some habitats. So here you are and take it away. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I just kind of wanted to preface this. This came about, um, Judy had reached out and asked me to expound on a discussion that some of us have had in a local Virgin Islands working group, uh, discussing sort of the long-term responses to continued bleaching and what that me might mean for some of our ongoing restoration work, especially a lot of it does tend to be in the near shore zone and in the shallow. So that was the, the origin of this. Um, so I think most of us understand that we're not restoring rights to the historic states, right? But rather to target set by practitioners based on the concepts of either coastal resilience, ecological resilience, or both. Uh, the coastal zone has historically attracted human development. Many of the world's major cities are situated along the coast. And reefs are hugely important for protecting coastal infrastructure, acting as submerged breakwaters, sustaining wave energy by up to 97%. And this important fact has finally been recognized by uh, government agencies and funding institutions. Uh, and we are seeing a lot of funding now being funneled into coastal restoration programs with the goal of bolstering coastal resilience. And that's what CNC's current work is uh, doing in the USBI. We're working on the Shadow Barrier Reef with the idea that they are not only um, bolstering ecological resilience, but we're trying to protect our coastline as well. And then there's the ecological resilience. So while we're trying to build these protective reef features up to the point that they can continue to physically provide protection against sea level rise, increasing storm frequency and intensity to some time point in the future, most programs are also aimed at increasing coral cover and genetic diversity with the idea that reaching calculated targets for restoration sites can bring the local coral community back to the point that it can, it can be self-generating once more uh, and increase the level of certain species that have de decreased below an ecological threshold for a variety of reasons. And then these efforts have both ecological benefits as well as people. So the idea of the super coral or corals um, and genotypes with some superior tolerance or survivorship in the face of various stressors, stressors, especially heat stress, has come about in recent years, and there's been a lot of research into that. But as this last marine heat wave has shown, that even corals propagated from parent lines uh, that have survived past bleaching events may still succumb to extreme heat stress. And we know that's only going to continue to increase into the future. But does this mean that we should give up our efforts in the near shore and in the shallows? And as I've said earlier, near shore reefs are vital for protecting our coastlines and we should keep bolstering that ecosystem service for as long as we possibly can. Uh, these near term mitigations, which are occurring mostly in the near shore, will ensure that we have the, the tools that we need down the road uh, for long term solutions. I liken this effort to the COVID response, sort of flattening the curve. Um, our work today will keep species alive into the future and hopefully keep productive populations viable for use in future stock. But we do need to start thinking about long-term solutions, whether that's 10 years, 20 years, or 50 years from now, there's going to come a point where even the hardiest and most resilient strains of coral are going to be able to survive a total onslaught of the initial calories. So this may prompt the need for strategic retreat from some reefs, uh, similar to what coastal communities are planning for sea level in the future, um, sea level rise in the future. So some cities and municipalities are starting to pull back from the coastline, do we need to pull back our efforts into deeper waters with our restoration? Uh, in the Pacific, I think there's been plenty of conversations back and forth with coral lists that everybody's seen in recent weeks. Um, the idea of moving corals that have survived bleaching events or their offspring from shallow reefs into deeper waters has been posed. But the reefs in the Pacific are very different in structure from ours. We don't have atolls. Um, we don't necessarily have immediately adjacent deeper reefs that, that, would, that would work for all areas. Um, and what waters are safe for how long will we be safe? So these, this points to a need for identification of thermal refugia. There's been some regional work that's been done already. For example, the Nature Conservancy conducted a collaborative effort with several institutions to develop a thermal refugia model for the Caribbean uh, that identified priority sites for management of reef ecosystems into the future. However, this needs to be done on a smaller, um, more meaningful scale to managers. 
uh, and help them lead the decision. So in summary, um, we need to should continue with our current restorations for ecological resilience, in, including in the shallows, in the near shore zone, to ensure that we have the tools needed for future restoration work um, and that those tools persist. You know, we flatten the curve and to extend performance of near shore reefs as coastal protection for as long as we can. We need to identify thermal refugia on local scales and conduct research into methods of retreat and transition into the Caribbean, um, including predictive timetables. Okay. Thank you very much, you Jessica. Sure. Um, your thermal refugia concept, I think Lorenzo is still with us, and I was wondering if he would address whether or not um, Bonanza is uh, chronically warmer than Limones off in the Puerto Morelos area, since it bleached very badly and the Limones area was, was cooler and less affected by bleaching? Would that be one example of a thermal refugia that the TNC may or may not have any advanced knowledge of? Uh, are you asking from our modeling that's been done? I'm not sure I'd have to look into that. Well, um, uh -huh. I think that this is an excellent opportunity to sort of ground truth any modeling that's been done to date and say, okay, where does it match up? Where does it not? And where does it need to be defined? Well, I was going to ask Lorenzo. I think he's still here. Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Uh, well, you know, the, this is a, a really good question. And, and even in Limones, we have these this stands that are fully bleached and others that are relatively OK. So yes, it might be the case. How, however, uh, and obviously, as Lisa was presenting, I'm 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 suspecting that is something with the genotypes of the of the acropolis. Uh, but in the end, the temperature is really really hot even there. So I I I would be a little bit cautious and wait until the end of September or beginning of October to 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 see whether we have a thermal refuge there. Sorry, but it's. Yeah. But yes, yes, it, it definitely is different. It's completely different having just one degree in between these two reefs, the, the outcome that you see. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other uh, quick questions for people? I had a quick question for both, um, well, first for Valeria. Uh, you had mentioned and shown a really great slide of a bleached um, orbicella coral. And I think it's a really great point that you bring up about, you know, having the opportunity to go out and look at corals, maybe spawning. Um, normally when we do coral bleach watch programs, we look at what's, you know, what's bleaching and hopefully we get out to see if it has recovered or if it has, um, if there's any mortality. But I think you bring up a really good point about looking also for, are those connies that are bleached, are they spawning? I don't know if you wanted to take a quick uh, minute to talk a little bit more about like the uh, spawning and um, corals that you might be seeing uh, both bleached and spawning, and if you've seen it in the past. Uh, thank you. So yes, we have seen it, but so I'm, um, okay, let me, let me start over. Uh, so this time, as I said already, we had been observing bleaching for, it's going to be a month and a half. Um, sorry about it, let me start my video. Uh, okay, again, sorry. Uh, so we have seen bleaching corals for almost two months and I'm gonna say like the star corals, the orbicellas, they have been bleached for over a month. We weren't sure that they were going to, to spawn. Um, so it wasn't me doing the observations, but another colleagues, they went out to, to do the observations. And actually they have a really good, massive, even better than last year. And last year bleaching was very, was very late, but it's actually in November. So I have seen bleach corals in other places, not the Bahamas, in Colombia, we have collected um, the gametes and the larvae raised in on land, they have been doing great. 
the main thing like I didn't well I didn't plan right now to do any collection not only related to permits but especially because I don't have the setup to do any lab uh, facility larva rearing um, and right now like I said like water temperatures here are 33 and I don't think that the larvae and anyone if they have more data will survive that much this kind of really warm waters so we didn't want to risk it hope this helps yeah, thank you. And and just the perspective of remembering for people to look for spawning as well as for bleaching. And Valeria, before you disappear, uh, I'll I'll have a comment for you. You asked about relationships between SCTLD and bleaching, and it's um, it's been the case in the Northern Caribbean that usually when corals bleach in prior years, and these are of course are less extreme bleaching events than are occurring this year. But in prior years, when corals have bleached, the SETLD activity has uh, regressed. And like, for example, in the Turks and Caicos Islands, Alize found that not only did individually individual corals that were sick um, stop getting sick while they were bleached, but also the disease front stopped advancing along the uh, north coast of Providenciales. And it only resumed after the um, bleaching event was over and the corals had regained their zooxanthellae. The same thing has been found every year that there has been bleaching in the Florida Keys. It's a well-established fact there that water gets warm in the summer and coral bleaching and, and SETLD activity decreases. It has not been true north of, of the Miami, Broward County, and other uh, coral formations that occur along the coast of Florida, up as far north as the Indian River. And in fact, summertime there, there's a lot of rain in addition to um, warming. And for some reason, um, bleaching continues year round, and if anything, is increased in the summertime. But to the extent that they have been able to correlate it with any environmental factor, so far the, the um, relationship is stronger for temperature than it is for changes in water salinity or you know pollution, uh, to the extent that pollution is adequately measured. And this year, despite the horrible responses to the incredible warming in the Keys that um, Simon exemplifies, there's been an, a reduction in SETLD correspondingly in the Keys. There has been no bleaching for the Miami and uh, SETL is raging. Yeah, here it's been like, I would say that the prevalence of uh, SETLD has decreases with bleaching yeah. but it hasn't disappeared it hasn't. And, and not even like kind of uh especially not in d lab but there are some species that that was like kind of one of my my main questions is corals like mcav we don't have much mcav bleaching like it's been or in the areas that we don't have a stony coral tissue disease because right now it's difficult to see like the the mandrinas or drusmelias or dicosenias they were looking great and that was good but i don't i don't know i know that it's related with the symbiont and everything but for us was like kind of why the highly susceptible species are not bleaching compared to the others but I would recommend everyone if they have the time to go and see if corals are reproducing. I think that is key that we understand exactly because our theory, in theory, we have been always told like if they're breed, they're not gonna reproduce. Yeah, and I know they've been preparing all the time, and maybe this was, and we'll see how is everything in terms of spawning next year. But that is information that will help us for sure. Um this this is similar to observations of corals with SETLD that are dying and yet they're still releasing gametes uh, yeah. during the reproductive season, presumably because they've already committed to reproduction and yeah. continue anyway. Um, so thank you very much. And if we don't have any other questions, well, you can write them in the chat still, 
but I am going to um, transition us to the final section of um, briefly introducing you to some of the resources that are available online. And I'll ask Patricia to put up the uh, resource slide. And um, when she does, you'll see that the first uh, entry there is the um, August 8th webinar that was given by the Coral Reef Consortium. And at the very beginning, there is a really good 12 minute explanation by Derek uh, Manzello on the products that the NOAA Coral Reef Health Watch uh, puts out. And uh, Lorenzo showed some of them in his talk. Um, they're very useful. If you don't know them, please um, acquaint yourself with them. And, uh, and if you need help understanding what they represent, um, go to the bleach predictions. Uh, if, you, if you have help understanding what the bleach predictions down there in the bottom represent, you can get a really superb quick explanation from um, Derek Mantello in the first part of the Coping with the 2023 um, CRC's webinar. Uh, it also has other examples of shading tables later in the webinar, um, an explanation uh, more from the theoretical end um, of the need for genetic diversity when rescuing corals, and um, lots of good suggestions about appropriate responses for any group that has adequate resources to tag and photo, et cetera, corals that may or may not be bleached for um, long-term measurements of how corals respond uh, to this current stress, um, as you know, also exemplified by Lisa in her talk for Belize. And now I'm gonna ask uh, Patricia to talk about the other two uh, components. Um, real quickly, because uh, I know we're coming to um, close to the end of the uh, our time here, I wanted to share, um, there is a new resource um, put out by the Coral Reef Alliance called um, the Coral's uh, Bleaching Toolkit and Comprehensive Guide. And this is a really great collection um, that is kind of synthesized, uh, lots of different information on how do you monitor, um, how do you uh, respond, um, and it uh, also has good advice on for managers on actions that they can take. Um, so I would encourage you to take a, a look at this new resource that is out on the Coral Reef Alliance um, webpage. I also put this information in the chat so you can have the direct link. Uh, we would also encourage you to please share um, observations in the tracking map at Agro's Coral Bleaching um, uh, track map. Uh, similar to stony coral tissue loss disease, uh, we are helping to collaborate and work with everyone in the region to uh, do a collaborative um, tracking effort. So uh, for those who have um, observing coral bleaching, please share that on here because I think it really helps to learn from one another um, and also uh, help to provide more information on what people are seeing. And then as uh, Judy had mentioned earlier, uh, I encourage you um, to go <clears throat> to Noah's Coral Reef Watch products and check out their bleach predictions. Um, and as Lorenzo had said earlier, uh, these are really useful to understand the temperature stress in your area. Judy, back to you. Yes, well, uh, Patricia's reminded me that um, in November, we'll return to talking about coral rescue and recovery, including the coral recruit identification um, uh, webinar that we were intending originally to present today. And um, if you have any other ideas as to what you would like to see being addressed in future CCT meetings, please um, put them in the chat before you sign off or email me at, I will put my email in the chat right now, jlang at reposy.web, not dot net. And my goodness, I can't even find the bottom of the chat. It's gotten so long. I thank you all for such great participation. Okay, here we come. J Lang at reposy.net. And uh, email me if you want to make any suggestions or follow up on anything that was discussed this morning for which we didn't have time to develop in more detail. And we do want to thank all of our speakers today. Um, we uh, really appreciate the time and effort, especially at the last minute, um, because of this heat stress is really expanding in the Caribbean. Um, this was kind of a last minute thing to pull all the speakers together. So I really want to um, thank Rulio, Lorenzo, Valeria, 
Alizé, Simon, Jessica, and Lisa for taking time to get today to share what they're seeing, um, their lessons learned, and really providing you know good information on you know how this heat stress is uh, expanding in the region and um, the effects that it's having. Um, would probably like to end on the. This is a really serious event, but also on um, Alizé's comment that, you know, look for coral recruits because that was one of the encouraging things was to see coral recruits of those SCTLD susceptible species um, and seeing that they are, there are still survivors out there and also to take that time to look for coral spawning um, so that we can see if these corals are stressed, if they can still spawn and still reproduce. So um, it is a very serious event. Uh, please keep an eye and um, share as you learn and uh, but keep an eye out for those hope spots as well. So thank you to our speakers. And Judy, if you have closing words. Um... Yes, indeed. Um, the corals are still reproducing and recruits are still appearing on the reef. So the corals haven't given up hope and we must keep trying as well. <laughs>